16-year-old Billy Carroll was well-known in his Chicago neighborhood, mainly because he was friendly and funny. However, Billy also had his secrets. He spent little time at home and little time at school. He spent most of his days on the streets, but even his friends were in the dark as to what he did with most of his time. Despite coming from an impoverished family, he always seemed to have money, which was unusual in the uptown neighborhood. When he had cash, he loved to spend it on food, and he had nicer things, like skates, that most kids in the neighborhood did not have access to. When he came into extra cash, he would also use it to buy food and clothes for his friends. Billy was clever and driven to make money, which sometimes led to him acquiring it by less than legal means. Billy was the middle child of three. His parents struggled to support them, especially Billy's younger sister Caroline, who had been born with severe disabilities. Eventually, the family had to make the difficult decision to place her in a residential facility. Caroline lived there until 2012, when she passed away. Both of Billy's parents drank and were abusive, and Billy would eventually come to blows with his father on numerous occasions, sometimes out of self-defense, and sometimes defending his mother. After watching the 1972 Olympics on television, Billy became focused on working out. He joined the local YMCA so he could swim, box, and lift weights. Samuel Stapleton was born in Chicago, but grew up in a humble home with no running water in the woods near the Ohio-Kentucky border. While his family did not have much money, Sam thrived as he ran wild through the woods, getting dirty and scraped up as he climbed trees and jumped into creeks. Sam's family eventually moved to Chicago for more economic opportunities, living in multiple neighborhoods over time. When his family moved to the Chicago neighborhood of Uptown, he made a point of identifying, and then easily beating up, the toughest kid in the neighborhood, before his family's belongings were even brought into their apartment so as to immediately secure a tough reputation with the other kids. He knew how to defend himself physically and how to respond when someone was taking advantage of him, something he appears to have inherited from his mother, Bessie. He was streetwise and knew how to navigate around the various gangs that operated in his neighborhood. In May of 1976, Sam was preparing to enter high school. He looked forward to joining ROTC at Sen High School. He had his first job as a delivery boy for a local pizza shop and hoped to soon have even better employment. A contractor calling himself John would call the Stapleton home asking for Sam with the promise of a job with his company. The boy Sam beat up upon his arrival to Uptown was Randy Reffitt, who did not harbor a grudge over the fight. The two boys were not close friends, but managed to coexist as two of the toughest kids in their neighborhood. Randy was one of four children, and his family originally hailed from Kentucky. His father was abusive towards his mother, and the children sometimes tried to protect her from him. They all, including Randy, would sometimes run away for brief periods when their home life became too difficult to deal with, but they always came home after a short time. He was just 15 years old when he disappeared on May 14, 1976. Dale Landigan moved around extensively as a child, which was reflected in his name. His name was really Frank, but his father nicknamed him Dell because he had been born in Delaware, which eventually evolved into Dale. He and his four sisters all adored their mother. After years of living in Brooklyn, the family moved to Chicago's uptown neighborhood in 1969, to escape growing crime in New York and join Dale's great-uncle Pablo, who owned an apartment building where he offered Dale's family a unit. Dale liked to play pranks, although he could sometimes take them too far, once convincing his family that he had been hit by a car and killed at a gas station. He could come off as aggressive and pushy, but could ultimately win over friends. In February of 1978, 19-year-old Billy Kindred was in love with his girlfriend Mary Jo. The young couple planned to marry once Billy found a good job. One night, however, Billy failed to show up for their nightly meeting, and all his belongings were found left in his bedroom. Mary Jo reported him missing, and spent months driving around Chicago looking for him after she got off of work. When Mary Jo first met Billy, she took note of how physically attractive she found him, but she had truly been drawn in by his kind smile. He respected her, and he respected his elders, 
which won him the approval of Mary Jo's mother and grandmother. Gregory Godzik was a hockey player, but he did not have the aggressive personality associated with the sport. Sometimes people would try to fight him, but he had little patience for such things. He was instead kind-hearted with a carefree nature. He lived with his parents and sister, and was the grandson of Polish immigrants. He had left a job with a lumber company because he had been paid so well by John Wayne Gacy for contracting work. John Sitch was the middle child of five. He loved animals from a young age and kept pets ranging from bullfrogs to albino hamsters. He regularly brought home stray dogs and cats from the neighborhood to care for as well. As a child, he was an altar server at Chicago's oldest Polish church and attended the parish school. His family moved to the suburb of Des Plaines just before he began his junior year of high school, and he quickly made friends with the members of the school's drama department, hanging out with them in the woods after school. He also got a job at a local pet store. One of his high school friends described him as a sweetheart and claimed to have never seen John without a smile. He remained close with his friends in Chicago even after he moved, and returned there for parties and nights out, although he was not a big drinker. 20-year-old David Talzma volunteered for the Marines in 1977. He was on inactive duty when he had plans to attend a concert in Hammond, Indiana, on the evening of December 9, 1977. He had made arrangements to meet up with a young woman there around 2 a.m., but he never showed up. He instead vanished. 15-year-old Rob Peist kept a busy schedule. He was an honor student at Maine West High School. He was two merit badges and a community service project, shy of reaching his goal of becoming an Eagle Scout. Extracurricular activities, like working tech on his school play or gymnastics, kept him at school until 5.30 p.m., and on most days, his mother would pick him up from school with a hot meal that he would eat on his way to work his 6 to 9 p.m. shift at Nissen's Pharmacy. His co-workers there would later describe him as a wholesome kid, who they could not envision ever smoking or using swear words. He was kind and polite, sometimes loaning his coat to the girl working the front register, who was subjected to cold air when the door to the store was opened. He was supposed to go home after his shift on December 11, 1978, to eat cake to celebrate his mother's 46th birthday, but he instead left with John Wayne Gacy to discuss a summer job with his construction company. Rob had just been denied a raise at the pharmacy, and Gacy's rate of $5 an hour was nearly double what he was making there. He was saving up to buy a Jeep, with $900 already put aside for the eventual purchase, once he could drive. John Prestige grew up in Michigan, mainly in the Kalamazoo area. His father lived in a trailer there, and his mother and stepfather owned a beehive farm in a nearby town. He began taking healthcare classes part-time at Kalamazoo Valley Community College after graduating high school, paying for them by working at a local motel. He did not get along with management there and traveled whenever he could to get away from the stresses of his everyday life. He had gone to New Orleans for Mardi Gras in February of 1977, and the following month he was in Chicago visiting a friend as he made his way out to Colorado to go skiing. 17-year-old Michael Bonin lived near Wrigley Field with his father, stepmother, and younger sister before going missing on June 3, 1976. His fishing license was later found inside Gacy's home. He was athletic, a talented wrestler and baseball player. At the time of his disappearance, he had been working at a gas station. Russell Nelson was an architecture student at the University of Minnesota who came to Chicago in the fall of 1977, towards the beginning of a long road trip that would take him as far north as Toronto and as far south as Florida. He was a talented dancer who had won competitions back in Minnesota. He was last heard from on October 17, 1977, when he called his mother to wish her a happy birthday. According to his mother, he and a friend had been doing work for a contractor while in Chicago. Russell also left behind a fiancé. As the son of a police sergeant, 18-year-old Robert Gilroy received one of the most extensive investigations into his disappearance when he first went missing. His father conducted his own investigation, and his file with the Chicago police consists of more than 40 pages. 
Robert disappeared on September 15, 1977. After telling his parents, he was going to his horseback riding lesson in Northbrook, although he had in fact stopped attending the lessons weeks earlier. He was not reported missing until nearly two weeks later, because he was supposed to be at a camp in Gaithersburg, Maryland. He never made it to the camp. Rick Johnston lived in the suburb of Bensonville, but was last seen in Chicago when his mother dropped him off in front of the Aragon Ballroom in the Uptown neighborhood. Multiple bands were playing the venue that night, but Rick told his mother he would call her for a ride home after the band Spirit played their set. He never made that call. His family feared he had been recruited by a cult because of his recent interest in religion and studying the Bible. They traveled as far as Washington, D.C. to look for Rick amongst the congregants of Reverend Moon's Unification Church at one of their rallies. 19-year-old Daryl Sampson was a native of West Virginia, but was living in Chicago's uptown neighborhood when he went missing in April of 1976. He had previously run away as a juvenile in 1973 in an effort to get out of a court appearance related to curfew violations. Within a few days, he was at his father's house in Virginia. After he disappeared in 1976, he would not be seen again until his remains were found under Gacy's dining room floor at the end of 1978. The family of Matthew Bowman of Crystal Lake, Illinois, had already lost one of its members to homicide. Matthew's stepfather, Anthony Rovatuso, was shot and killed during a carjacking in 1975. Matthew's mother last saw him on July 5, 1977, when she dropped him off at a rail station so he could get to a court appearance over a parking ticket. He called her a few hours later to let her know he would be going to Chicago to visit his sister at her apartment. He left his sister's apartment around 6 or 7 o'clock that night after telling her he was going home. He never arrived. John Mowry had also been impacted by homicide before he himself was murdered. In November of 1972, when he was just 14 years old, he had been sent to his sister Judy's apartment to check on her, only to find her stabbed to death on the floor. John joined the Marines after graduating high school, returning to Chicago after completing his service. He worked at a bank and began taking accounting classes at Truman College in Uptown. The last time his mother saw him was at her home, where he came for dinner in an effort to cheer himself up after one of his dogs was struck and killed by a car. 20-year-old Tommy Bowling was the married father of a three-year-old boy named Timmy. Before disappearing on November 18, 1977, he called his parents home to check in on his father, who had not been feeling well. Around this time, he had been receiving threatening phone calls, which he took seriously enough to instruct his mother to contact the police should she not hear from him for 24 hours. 16-year-old Robert Winch was one of six children from Michigan. His father taught physics at Kalamazoo College. Robert had difficulties at home, which led to him staying in a foster home during weekdays. He ran away from that foster home in November of 1977. Timothy O'Rourke was 20 years old when he vanished on June 30th, 1978. He had a distinctive tattoo that read Tim Lee on his left arm a tribute to his love for martial artist Bruce Lee. He frequented gay bars and was close friends with a transgender woman, which Gacy's defense team later tried to use to undermine the witnesses who spoke on his behalf at Gacy's trial. 20-year-old James Mazzara of Elmwood Park was last seen by his family the day after Thanksgiving of 1978. He had the nickname of Mojo. 16-year-old Kenneth Parker's family lived in the Edgewater neighborhood after moving to Chicago from Tennessee. He was going through a difficult time and was on parole. He spent a lot of time hanging out at the Yankee Doodle Dandy, a restaurant in Midtown, with his longtime friend, Michael Marino. Michael Marino was just 14 years old. He and Kenneth Parker were last seen alive on October 24, 1976, at the Yankee Doodle Dandy. The remains were later found in a shared grave beneath Gacy's house. His mother had reported him missing after he failed to arrive to see a movie with her as planned on the evening of October 24th. John Bukovich was later described as a nice kid who lived with his family on the north side of Chicago. 
He was close with his parents and sisters, and had plenty of friends. He would always call home if he would be returning late. He had dropped out of high school to work in construction, and worked for Gacy on and off for over a year. When he disappeared in July of 1975, he reportedly was trying to get Gacy to pay him back wages he still owed him. John's family always suspected that Gacy was involved in his disappearance, and called police every week for more than two years, trying to get them to investigate his case seriously. Authorities insisted that John had simply run away. Circumstances did not support this theory. John had been working to renovate his first apartment, and had just spent $2,000 on carpeting before he disappeared. He also left behind a large amount of money in his bank account. Also discrediting the runaway theory was the fact that his car was left behind, in a location Gacy would later admit to moving it to. The keys were left in the ignition, and John's wallet, keys, and ID were on the front seat. These 24 of Gacy's victims were identified by March of 1980. In June of 1981, the nine victims who had still not been identified were laid to rest in donated caskets. A short service for all nine victims was held outside Abbey Chapel of the Oak Ridge Glen Oak Cemetery, and each victim also received his own graveside service when he was buried under a grave marker reading, We Remembered. Each victim was buried in a different cemetery. In May of 1986, one of these victims was identified as 16-year-old Timothy Jack McCoy, leaving authorities with eight individuals to identify. Tim had small-town origins, but an extensive travel history, living in and visiting numerous states across the country during his short life. This was the result of both his father's restlessness, which brought the family to places like California and Florida, and his own. He was mischievous and daring from a young age, and was never afraid to throw himself into a lake or even a moving boxcar without hesitation. At 15, he left school and obtained a fake ID so that he could work as a forklift operator. Tim's life was largely formed by his large extended family. It made up a large part of the population of his hometown of Bartlett, Iowa, and he traveled regularly to spend time with the members of the family who had moved throughout the Midwest. He spent New Year's of 1972 visiting one of his cousins in Michigan. He left Michigan by bus to return to Omaha, where his father was living, on January 2nd. He had an overnight stop in Chicago, during which he met Gacy at the Greyhound station. In October of 2011, Cook County Sheriff Tom Dart announced a renewed effort to identify the remaining eight victims. They were all exhumed so that samples could be taken for DNA testing, and Sheriff Dart made an appeal to the public, asking for friends and relatives of young men or teenage boys who went missing any time between 1970 and December 22, 1978, to contact his office. The appeal quickly yielded results. The boy previously only identified as Gacy victim number 19 was identified as 19-year-old William George Bundy, on November 29, 2011. Bill's mother had feared he had been one of Gacy's victims and tried to get his dental records to submit to police, as they had requested, back in 1979. However, his dentist had retired, and by the time she was able to track him down, he had destroyed all of his records. Bill was identified after his brother and sister provided DNA samples. Bill had been popular at Sen High School, and had plenty of friends. According to his sister Laura, all of her friends wanted to date him, and only came to see her at her house for the opportunity to see her brother. He was a talented diver and gymnast. However, Bill ultimately chose to drop out of high school to begin doing electrical work. Bill went missing in October of 1976. One evening, he told his family he was headed out to a party as he was leaving the house. He forgot to take his wallet with him. He never came home. In July of 2017, victim number 24 was identified as 16-year-old Jimmy Hackinson. His mother had gone to Chicago from her home in Minnesota in 1979 to try to learn if her son was amongst Gacy's victims, but she did not have dental records to submit to the police to identify him. He was also identified thanks to DNA submitted by his brother and sister. 
Jimmy was one of four children and lived in St. Paul, Minnesota. He was funny and good-natured, despite difficult circumstances at home. His father drank heavily and was largely absent, and his mother often had to work as many as three jobs at a time to support the family. One day in the summer of 1976, he announced to his family that he was going to Chicago. Hitchhiking was not unusual at the time, and Jimmy had left home in the past to get away from stressors at home. He had always safely returned, so this trip did not raise any concerns. He called his mother on August 5th to let her know that he had safely made it to Chicago. However, weeks then passed with no calls from Jimmy, and he did not return home, so he was reported missing at the beginning of September. The number of unidentified Gacy victims then dropped to five on October 25th, 2021, when the man previously only known as Gacy victim number five was publicly identified as Francis Wayne Alexander. In addition to his extended family, Wayne is survived by his mother, two half-sisters, and two half-brothers. DNA extracted from one of victim number five's molars had undergone eight months of specialized testing and processing to prepare a profile suitable to be used with genetic genealogy. The Cook County Sheriff's Office partnered with the DNA Doe Project for the genealogical research. Genealogists identified Wayne as a potential match and submitted his name to the Sheriff's Office. Investigators there used more traditional means of investigation to follow up on the lead. When they could not find any evidence of Wayne being alive after the time period when they believed victim number five was killed, which would have disproven the identification, they traveled to North Carolina to meet with his family. They collected DNA samples from Wayne's mother and brother, which confirmed that Wayne was Gacy victim number five. Wayne was born in 1955. He grew up in North Carolina and lived in New York for a time. He got married while he was living there. He and his wife moved to Chicago in February of 1975, but the couple soon divorced, after three months of marriage. His family never filed a missing persons report because, based on certain decisions that he had made, they believed he wanted to be left alone. While they loved him, they thought he no longer wanted anything to do with them when he stopped contacting them. Wayne supported himself by working at various bars and clubs in Chicago. Authorities do not know exactly how he and Gacy crossed paths, but Wayne lived and worked in an area where Gacy was known to look for victims. He lived near several other victims of Gacy, including William Bundy, who lived just blocks away from Wayne. Wayne would have been 21 or 22 years old when he was killed. The last official record of him was a traffic ticket issued to him on January 5, 1976. He was buried at Gacy's property under an individual whose death authorities have placed on March 15, 1977, indicating that Wayne was killed sometime during the window of time between receiving the traffic ticket and the death of the other victim. Financial records show that Wayne earned very little income in 1976, potentially indicating that he was killed earlier on in that window. When investigators returned to the Alexander family to confirm that Wayne was in fact Gacy victim number five, on October 22, 2021, there were five generations of the family in the room to hear the news. Wayne's mother was the first parent to still be alive to be notified that their son had been identified as one of Gacy's victims since the renewed effort began in 2011. The family greatly appreciated the kindness the people of Cook County had showed Wayne, giving him a proper funeral and burial, even though they had not known his identity when they did so. As of November of 2022, five of Gacy's victims remain unidentified, but investigators still hope to one day identify all of them. Victim 10 is believed to have been between 17 and 21 years old, and between 5 feet 7 and 5 feet 11 inches tall. He had a well-heeled fracture to his left clavicle. His time of death has been estimated to have been between March 15th and July 5th of 1977. Victim 13 is estimated to have been between 5'11 and 6 feet 2 inches tall, and between 17 and 22 years old. His hair was a dark enough brown that it would appear black. He was probably suffering from a severe toothache at the time of his death, which has been estimated to have been between August and October of 1976. 
Victim 21's remains were completely skeletonized by the time they were discovered, complicating the process of determining exact details about him. He was most likely between the ages of 15 and 27, and between 5 foot 8 and 6 feet tall. Based on the location where his remains were found, relative to other victims with known dates of death, it is believed he was killed sometime between June 13th and October 25th of 1976. Victim 26 is estimated to have been between 5 feet 2 and 5 feet 6 inches tall, and between 22 and 30 years of age. He was most likely murdered sometime between June 13th and August 6th, 1976. Victim 28 was killed sometime between early 1972 and the end of July of 1975. He was between 5 foot 8 and 5 feet 9 inches tall and 14 and 18 years old. He was found wearing a white metal band on his left ring finger. He had brown hair and may have previously broken his right upper arm. 